you this week. We had one yesterday and we've got 10 more, um, including our AGM. These, this conference is only possible thanks to the support of BTO members. So huge thank you to all the BTO members that are on the call today. Income from memberships and donation make up almost half of our charity's total income. So without the support, um, without your support, sorry, the BTO just wouldn't be what it is today. So thank you very much. If you're in position to make an extra donation to support our work, we would be extraordinarily grateful. And you can do this at a special conference link, which is bto.org forward slash support. Our members are our lifeblood, and it's through membership support that we can inspire and inform and make a difference for our birds. If you're not a member already, but you enjoy today's talk and you feel like the BTO is an organization you might want to support, please consider joining us. Okay, so thank you all very, very much for joining us again. I understand that we are in direct competition with a, a, a sporting event of note, so it's great to see so many people here. We'll jump straight into our first talk now, which will be presented by John Caladine from BTO Scotland. The theme of our session tonight is BTO's latest research. So John is going to be telling us all about his fantastic research on creating sensitivity maps for breeding waders. John, whenever you're ready, you can crack on. Okay, thank you. Let me just see, uh, just let me know. Have you got the screen there? I can see it. You can see it. Excellent. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is really um, around a conflict in conservation between waders and woodland, and very specifically what you have done in terms of towards resolving this conservation conflict. And by what you have done, I'm meaning what you've contributed in terms of taking part in various bird surveys. just trying to get this to change here we go so why do we survey birds um mostly because it's fun i guess if it wasn't fun people wouldn't do it uh we get a little bit obsessed with some of the sites as well um wondering what's going on repeat going to these sites time and time again to see how things have changed and how what we see on our local patches compares with the national picture in many ways but uh, always in the back of your mind there's actually what we're doing in collecting this data is that it's going to be used for some purpose uh, for conservation and this is actually going to be a case study of exactly how we're using this data to inform a conservation conflict uh, for waders. Many of you have seen graphs such as this and images such as this uh, this comes from the Breeding Bird Survey, the BBS, that shows the trends in waders. You can see rather depressingly declines for most species over the period since the mid 90s. And also the uh, bird atlas that shows the spatial distribution of those changes where declines have happened. You can see for most of those waders, it's pretty much across most of Britain and Ireland. Waders are a uh, high conservation priority now. Uh, in light of those declines, if you think that we've actually lost about half the curlew, lapwing and red shank since the mid 90s, that's really quite alarming. Uh, why these birds have declined, it's down to a number of reasons, as is usually the case. Uh, agricultural improvement, uh, drainage, afforestation and predation, increased rates of predation on all these birds at the nesting attempts, especially. How has forestry uh, come into this issue? Um, it occupies land uh, that was formerly, uh, you know, new planting is uh, on ground that could be uh, occupied by waders. So that will sort of uh, replace habitats that suitable for waders and fragment those habitats. But also in addition to that, it can actually increase the predation pressure on those breeding waders because woodlands can be a great host for crows, for foxes and so on, other predators that move into those areas. Now there's sort of, the numbers of sort of woodland expansion across Britain has been quite marked since the uh, early 1900s. Here you can actually sort of see the figure specifically for Scotland. In 1900, there was just about 5% forest cover in Scotland, Scotland being one of the more forested parts of the UK. Now that is up to 19%. However, there are plans to increase that to 25% by 2050. 
other countries of the UK have similarly ambitious targets for increasing woodland cover. Uh, Scotland's probably got the most ambitious and is probably actually delivering on that more effectively than uh, some of the other countries. However, when you think about to deliver this target in Scotland by 2025, so that's just in uh, whatever three years time, uh, they will be looking to create 150 square kilometres of new woodland every year. Now, that is a lot of woodland, and you can imagine that that could actually have quite a serious impact on breeding waders, uh, especially as just for many economic reasons, um, the sites where people choose to create new woodlands are often the uh, lower parts of the hill ground, the marginal farmland, which are often the refuges for many of these waders. They often support high density for waders. It has to be said, though, that woodlands, actually more woodlands is a good thing for many things. We want more woodland. It creates uh, jobs. It creates new habitats for birds. And also importantly, it's one of the uh, opportunities to sequester more carbon. So it is a, a nature based solution to use a, uh, I suppose, uh, much used sort of jargon at the moment to uh, mitigate against climate change uh, to deliver that. So. New woodlands is fantastic. It can also create new habitats for many woodland and shrubland birds, which are conservative, you know, species of conservation priority in themselves. So just really a conflict between various conservation priorities, one for waders, one for woodland, and all the sort of associated benefits there. So what have we done to do that? And why do people want that? Ideally, we would want to create new woodlands in areas where they are going to have low impact on waders. So what we need to do is to create some information that is available freely and easily to the public, to the planners, to the organisers, to forest agents uh, who are looking to uh, create all these new forests that the governments want so they can actually put them in places where they'll have minimum impact on waders. And these are the kind of things that we have created. This is sort of a map showing the relative abundance of breeding curlew across Britain. And these are available on this website that you can see at the top. It's available on the BTO website. It's also available on the Forest Commission's uh, public outlook area. So anyone can access these maps and see the data behind them. And you can sort of zoom in to see what they are uh, close to. Uh, the red areas are high densities of waders, the grey areas the lowest, with the colours in between being that. Yeah, I suppose we are all in spirit at Swanwick, if we're not actually really there in person, so it just shows a blow up zoom in of what the case is, uh, what these maps look like for Curlew in Swanwick. And I'm going to really talk about how we've produced these maps, and by we, I mean all of us, including everybody who's undertaken these bird surveys. These maps, the core work of producing these maps comes from the bird atlas that we completed about sort of 10 years ago so here we've got maps uh, that show the distribution at 10 kilometer resolution however if you can remember back to doing the field work for these periods you remember that a lot of this data came from what were called time tetrads so they were visits of one or two hours to just tetrads two kilometer by two kilometer squares and within each of these 10 kilometer squares for which these dots represent at least eight of these tetrads were surveyed so what we've done is we've used these time tetrad data from the atlas period here and brought in a whole load of environmental variables here and modeled them using a statistical procedure called random forest regression trees to produce these maps on the right. Now, random forest regression trees has caused no end of confusion because we're, while doing this work, we've been dealing with forest industry, forest agencies, and they keep thinking that this is all specifically to do with creating trees. It's not, it's just a name for the statistical progress, but it is a really neat, neat process where you can actually bring in all the variables that you want, every, absolutely everything that you can get your hands on. It doesn't matter if there are correlations between them. If you're not interested, we are interested, but in this purpose, we, we don't really need to know which of the variables are the most important factors in creating these models. We just need to be able to put as much in as we can possibly do to get the best possible model awards. And if we can actually work out what these relationships using these models is for each of these tetras for which we have data, we can then make predictions 
because we've got all these environmental variables for all the other sites that haven't all the other tetras that have not been surveyed we can make predictions for those sites so we can actually get effectively what looks like comprehensive coverage for all these outputs and we've actually rescaled these outputs to one kilometer resolution the original data was at uh, at the tetrad level as i said so we've actually managed to sort of rescale it to a finer scale which is what the end users wanted what the forestry bodies wanted what the policy makers wanted they wanted to be able to zoom into these things to see what was happening locally in reality they actually wanted a field by field base assessment but that just really wasn't possible and to be honest it also wasn't uh, biologically meaningful these weighted use sort of much bigger areas than just single fields so to something to one kilometer resolution was a good compromise between the data that we got at a tetrad and this even finer scale resolution the end users wanted however when we're actually creating these it's important to remember that uh, this is really just a modelled output of relative abundance. We've got five strata of abundance here, red being high abundance, grey being low abundance, and these other colours in the intermediate. And I so say for most of it is modelled, so it's important to actually just test these models to see how accurate they are in their predictive capabilities. And probably the best thing that we could find to uh, an independent test of all these was to actually go to the breeding bird survey, the BBS, and actually look at what these models had predicted for those sites, those sites for which many of you who go out and do breeding bird surveys have collected data on waders, even sites without waders, so zero counts of waders are all important too. And to see how accurate our predictions were against those uh, BBS models. And they came out really good for, for most species. So we're really quite happy with these outputs to what we can look at here. And you can see just sort of examples of what these look like I say you can find all these maps available online you can zoom in look at your own areas look at areas that you're interested in and see what they look at and our aim is that uh, people planning forests will be able to look at these too and make decisions as to uh, you know where they're going to plant trees or what they what uh, probably sort of uh, how you know what uh, degrees of investigation they need to do to uh, look at sort of where there are proposals that are close to waders, how they may need to revise those uh, proposed plantings. We've done this for 10 species of waders that you can sort of see on these maps here. And you can see where all these go. As I say, we've sort of tested how uh, good these uh, model predictions were. They worked really well for the most obvious, the sort of most numerous species, those that are most widespread. So species like curly lapwing oyster catcher, these models performed really, really well. They were not quite so good for species that had more restricted distributions like green shank or species that had uh, quite specialized habitat selection like common sandpiper. Uh, you know, they're more of a riparian bird in many places. But these models are still pretty good. They're just not as good as these other ones. So when it comes to sort of looking at uh, how do we use these maps, it will be these sort of better performing models that we should sort of point people towards in uh, actually using these data. So how are we actually expecting people to use these? In an ideal world, you know, we ought to be having a joined up land use policy where we decide areas where we're going to maintain for waders, where we're going to sort of target conservation money towards uh, preserving those areas for waders and enhancing those areas for waders. And also looking at areas that would go towards trees could go and there'd be no impact on those sort of species whatsoever. Um, you know, we don't have no such thing as a national land use policy. It's just not going to happen in the foreseeable future. But it could happen to some degree that sort of uh, our hope is that people planning trees, planning woodlands, they are using these maps already. Certainly in England, these are all part of the whole planning policy now. They're actually using into those. And the other countries are starting to adopt them as well now. They look at these maps uh, at the moment, trying to identify areas what the way to interest is in areas where there are current applications and then looking at what levels of scrutiny or modification need for those certain planning applications but hopefully in the future people are going to be looking more sort of 
in advance of that and decided where are they going to plant trees it was sort of you know quite interesting when we were developing this whole piece of work that uh, got a number of forestry agents people who sort of hold businesses in sort of uh, talking to their clients landowners farmers and so on as to want to plant trees and trying to get them to encourage to use them and make use of various woodland grant schemes that are there available to do it and they sort of said you know actually if we'd actually got maps like this available they would not have put some of their proposals that they have decided would be close to important areas for waders just simply because it's just not worth their while because they find there's an area that's got waders they're told they can't sort of plant the trees there or told they've got to modify their forestry applications. It costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of, you know, it's a lot of hassle. It's probably not worth their while. It's not economically viable to plant those trees in those areas once they've had to modify them to uh, account for these waders. So in many ways, they would have said, if we didn't know we've got this information available, we would have told our client not to bother with a proposal in that area. However, if they knew they got land elsewhere in an area without wader interest, it would have guided them towards there. So although we probably don't have a national land use policy, I think in reality, we will be progressing towards one in terms of how people uh, use these maps to guide where they do put forward to their uh, forest proposals. But it's also going to be positive for waders that people can now see where the important areas are for waders. Uh, sort of put things like agri, you know, agri-environment schemes towards them there. I say that is probably what we will happen in the future. At the moment, there is actually a kind of a backlog of forest proposals that are under scrutiny because of various wader interests. So people are zooming in at these maps at probably larger scales to sort of see, looking at sort of wherever proposals are happening and seeing what are the uh, important areas for waders at these much finer scales. To be honest, this is perhaps sort of a secondary use of these maps or much sooner they'd be used at a bigger landscape scale process but absolutely fine they can be used to sort of zoom in to look at individual sites individual locations and people can then decide uh whether to progress with their proposals or if they've already or judging whether a proposal should go ahead make some assessments on what impact it might have on these uh, ground nesting and vulnerable birds Okay, so we've got these maps mostly across these whole species. So it was interesting to sort of merge them together to see what would be a whole sensitivity map for all breeding waders across Britain. So here's just an example that takes these six species. And it's just based on the maximum category for all these species. Obviously what going on in this land is a little bit more complicated for there. So basically for down here in Lancashire, these high areas for red really relate to just one species, lapwing. A similar area here of red, it's actually five of those species on the east uh, are important for these, uh, for these birds, uh, you know, for all those five species of birds. Or equally, if you look down at some of these areas in lowland England, it looks like they're not important for waders, but there are some locally important populations of curlew and lapwing there. So we need to have some sort of local perspective into how we uh, produce these overall importance and sensitivities for waders across. It's not just a whole national context, we've got to have a local context in it, plus an assessment of what the species assemblages is there, rather than just what single species these are. So this is really why we've not necessarily progressed with a, a single map for this, and we're sort of leaving it at just looking at the single species for a moment so people can look at the whole array of those 10 species that we've produced and actually look at the various nuances so they can actually make that assessment for themselves as to what species are important there and how what is the whole assemblage like there there's a whole lot of regional and local issues that need to be addressed before we could produce what is a formal agreed map for uh, just one map for all waders an alternative approach to this sort of single map might be to look at the mean for these six species. Again, you know, I think this approach would have problems in that many ways it underestimates the importance for many areas. You know, so for areas that might have high categories for two species, but not for the other species would just come out as a low category. However, this approach here does actually really highlight where are the really outstanding areas for breeding waders in Britain. And that sort of you know, really highlights the Northern Isles, the Western Isles, well, islands in general. 
Caith Ness, this sort of strip around the uh, East Highlands, the eastern side of the Southern Uplands, and the Uplands of Northern England, the Pennines, Bowland, North Yorkshire, and also the uh, coastal marshes in Southeast England. It just shows, you know, these are the real hot spots, the really key, super important areas for breeding waders across those areas. So a byproduct of this uh, sensitive mapping approach is we can actually start looking at uh, what type of land uses and landscapes are uh, supporting proportions of waders. And you can sort of see from the earlier map, there's actually two particular land uses and landscapes that support really uh, more, you know, really super important for breeding waders. And they are grouse moors and islands. For example, islands take up only just 5% uh, of the land area of Britain, but they support, you know, 34% of breeding red shank, 64% of Dunlin. Managed grouse moors occupy quite an astonishing 7% of the land area of Britain, and that supports 36% of breeding curlew, 47% of golden plover. So just these two landscapes in themselves, islands and grouse moors, support more than half of the breeding waders in Britain altogether, uh, which is really quite interesting. What are, you know, the factors there? Um, it's probably down to the sensitivity of predation, which comes back to these issues of why woodlands are actually impacting on uh, waders, sort of not only are they, you know, uh, replacing the ground, they are uh, increasing the predation risk of those birds on the remaining unplanted ground as well. And this site just sort of highlights that importance. Grouse moors are areas where uh, the land use deliberately targets predators to keep uh, low density of predators in those areas. Islands have naturally restricted suites of predators to do that. So it's really uh, interesting to know and sort of guide some sort of way forward as to where we're going to go with, with uh, management for lapwing, uh, management for waders in general. Um, you know, if we are to create areas, you know, wader areas and other areas, we clearly have to think about how we're going to manage the predation risk as well, as well as just creating the habitats for them. Okay, some other work that we're doing as well. Um, we don't have the results for this moment, but uh, some ongoing current work is looking at the cumulative impacts of woodland. So, you know, how much woodland can you have in a certain landscape before it starts uh, impacting on breeding waders? There are many areas such as this that have small bits of woodland. You know, how much can you have? Is it sort of 10% woodland, 20% woodland, 40% woodland in any one particular area before you start having any impact in woodlands? We're actually really just started. We're in the middle of a piece of work. We should be reporting on this in February that uh, uses the BBS, the Breeding Bird Survey, to actually answer this very question. So that is sort of another uh, real reason why, you know, how you people as surveyors have gone out and collected the data to be able to inform this uh, land use issue. John, we're about to run out of time. OK, so. no problem. Yeah. No problem. Having said this, we've talked about sort of the uh, sensitivities for waders. You know, it's only one side of the uh, the coin there. You know, we should be also interested as to what opportunities for woodland birds there are for creating all these new woodlands. We, you know, we've talked about sort of putting the right tree in the right place. In many ways, this sort of uh, sensitive to from waders is really just looking at the constraints for waders, um, constraints for sort of planting trees, but there are really lots of opportunities out there. So as well as sort of, you know, where they're going to plant trees to not impact on ground nesting birds in the areas where we're going to plant trees and what kind of trees should we plant there and what kind of uh, management should be included to do that, to actually maximise on the opportunities there. We shouldn't be concentrating just on the constraints, we should be looking for the opportunities. If they say we're going to be putting all these trees in, we want them to produce the best trees that can uh, deliver better for biodiversity in many ways. OK, so finally, sort of just thank you to just all the people who've contributed to this. You can see there's a whole load of people who have uh, taken part in the discussions, who've done this work deliberately. But I'm thinking that the biggest thanks is to all of you who've actually gone out and done these surveys to create these things. In all the surveys that you've done, you don't have to have gone to see any waders in them. Those zero counts are all important. So if you're going to do any of these uh, bird atlas, breeding bird surveys, Thank you very much for doing that. You've done a great job. Keep it up. Thank you very much for listening. 
Okay, thank you so much, John. That was fabulous. Uh, very much appreciated. So we'll quickly turn our attention to some questions. Uh, so we've got two questions with two votes. Please do vote on your favorite question if you're desperate to have it asked. So first I will ask a question from Ken Smith, who also said hi. <laughs> It looks like um, the lowlands and Wales will be covered in trees. Is this what is likely to happen? Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, where they plant, there's obviously much more than waders that uh, are going to decide where people can plant trees. There's a whole other sort of models and sensitivities in terms of climate and land use and alternative land uses are going to come into it. Waders are only there. But... Um, you know, uh, if we were thinking about, you know, waders were important. If there is the opportunity to plant trees in the lowlands of Wales and there is no other interest there and the, it is a commercial land use, then why not? Why shouldn't that be a reason? And if we are going to plant trees in there, as I say, you know, let's not just sort of plant blanket Sitka spruce or even worse, let's sort of think about how we're going to, ma you know, what trees to create and how they could be managed the best for what for all these woodland birds instead that's say at the moment most of the resources have gone into looking at the constraints for forestry i'm hoping that in the future we'll stop being able to look at the future you know the actual opportunities to do that so absolutely some areas you know there is lots of scope for recreating woodlands the plans to create woodlands let's maximize it let's maximize the opportunities that come out of it if the lowlands of wales fit the bill why not okay brilliant thank you very much so the next most popular question that we've got is about um raptor persecution on grouse moors how do you reconcile the good stats um for breeding waders on grouse moors with the persecution of raptors by some grouse moor operators basically i don't uh you know that is um that is a problem, actually. You know, it is uh, a pretty irreconcilable fact that uh, grouse moors do support all these waders. Grouse moors, undoubtedly, not all of them, but significant numbers of them do uh, kill species illegally and uh, unnecessarily as well. Um, it's no excuse for doing it. It's not a reason. Um, but, you know, I think sort of the facts do show up that basically some form of restriction of predators or control of predators is probably in well it's certainly important to maintain the densities of waders that we've got um you know as well as just um you know this is sort of a real issue if we're thinking about the islands as well in many places there are um you know non-native predators on islands and there are sort of problems with actually restoring those islands back to their natural suites of predators and i'm thinking in terms of hedgehogs on newest or stoats on orkney and people who've been involved with those be well aware that even sort of restoring uh, some of these areas to natural suites of predators is uh, quite problematic so it is a difficult one but uh, you know difficult decisions have to be made if you want uh, to maintain the waders on a big landscape, then grouse moors are clearly important. Um, if grouse moor managers are insistent that they cannot deliver what they can with just legal predator control, then there's some difficult decisions to be made. I think they can do it with what is legal predator control. So clearly that, you know, is just uh, crows, foxes, uh, mustelids. But uh, it has to be said, you know, that's not a, uh, you know, there's not universal support for any form of predator control in those areas. If the decision is made that that is not acceptable, then there's going to be a price paid in terms of breeding waders on those areas. Uh, you know, that's a societal decision, basically. OK, thank you very, very much, John. Uh, that's all the questions we've got time for. So we're going to move on now. You may have noticed earlier I, I developed a doppelganger, but now he has renamed himself as BTO Director of Science, James Pierce Higgins. Um, who is uh, fresh out of his meeting with the EFRA committee talking about avian flu today to talk to us about his latest research um, on the biodiversity crisis. So James, whenever you're ready, please do take it away. Thanks very much, Finn. And uh, it's really good to be with you this evening. Um, I was a bit worried when I was having some problems on the trains, but uh, yeah, really pleased to, uh, to be able to join you. Uh, and let's see if I can share my screen. 
Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Okay. So I'm going to be talking to you this evening about uh, insect declines, uh, bird declines, and the biodiversity crisis. Um, and as ever at the BTO, really what I'm uh, representing is a team effort. Uh, so very much uh, the work of Ailey Barnes uh, on the left, supported by uh, Rob Robinson in the middle. And also um, I'm going to be talking about some work that uh, Blaise Marte uh, on the right um, led on as well. And um, apologies if this is a slightly misleading title, and you'll see why I'm just why, why I say this in a second. And um, because actually I'm not going to talk too much about insects, and I'm even not going to talk too much about birds. Um, but uh, I'll explain myself as the talk goes on, and uh, it is still relevant to the topic, honest. Having said that, um, I think uh, as, as, as there's a thread kind of through my research career in that as a child, um, I was brought up in Suffolk uh, in, the, in the 1970s sort of and 80s, and uh, my passion actually was probably for insects. I uh, loved this book uh, by Michael Chinnery, and um, probably one of the reasons why I didn't go into entomology was I was just... In, in that era before um, um, digital cameras and access to the internet, uh, just got really frustrated with not being able to identify insects. Um, but I've always had that, that passion. And in the context of insect decline, species like uh, the wall brown at the top and the garden tiger moth at the bottom uh, were species, beautiful um, butterflies and moths that we used to see regularly uh, in, in, in my garden. And of course, um, those have both declined uh, dramatically in those habitats and certainly um, I haven't seen any uh, for many a long year uh, down here in Suffolk. But yet, there are some losers, but there are some winners as well. Um, one of the things I also do is some damselfly and dragonfly monitoring um, linked to uh, Arosha UK, and uh, species at the top here, the willow emerald uh, damselfly, is one that's um, rapidly colonising and expanding its distribution across East Anglia um, since it arrived uh, in the late 2000s from the continent. And the brown argus at the bottom, again, another range expanding butterfly. So even in my own personal experience, I can see that there are species or insects that have increased and some that have uh, declined. And in that context, we need to sort of throw some, some data at, uh, at the issue. And the whole topic of insect declines really hits the headlines um, on the back of this paper that was published in 2017, which looked at the abundance of aerial insects or biomass of aerial insects uh, from across Germany. So they um, took data that had been collected um, using these traps um, located in areas of semi-natural uh, habitat and protected sites and documented over a 27-year um, time frame about a 77% decline in aerial insect biomass over that period. So it's not down to habitat conversion, but clearly down to wider factors. And you'll note the log scale on the y-axis here. And that really first, um, I think, drew to the public's attention that there could be something significant going on with the abundance of aerial insects. In a UK context, um, we've got uh, long-term monitoring data from the Rothamsted Insect Survey. And here, uh, uh, abundance trends collated for large moths from their light trap network. Again, documenting about a 40% decline since uh, the 1970s. And turning, but yet turning to the Biological Record Centre data. So this is look collected by um, the Biological Record Centre at uh, CEH, then a collation of all the individual um, taxonomic recording schemes. If you look at the green line there, which shows the occurrence of insects and changes in insect occurrence through time, that's actually showing a positive trend of occupancy. There's, there's potentially more winners than losers there. Although if you look at some of the other invertebrate groups, it's a bit more negative. And actually there's a very mixed picture. Some of the insect groups, particularly um, those with a southerly distribution like bees, ants and wasps are going up. But there are other insect groups um, which are declining. And so really, um, despite a, a relative lack of long-term monitoring data, we've got a complex picture of invertebrate population trends in the UK. And I can certainly see that from my own experience. And I'd be interested to hear um, uh, other people's uh, sort of perceptions over the course of, uh, of, of their experiences as well. And these changes are um, down to a whole wide variety of causes. Clearly for habitat specialists, if that habitat is lost, that will have a negative impact on, on their abundance. And certainly many of the um, declining butterflies and moths have uh, been linked to the loss of um, particular food plants. Agricultural intensification has been a big driver since the 1970s and um, the widespread use of pesticides, which of course has been in the literature uh, and in the, in the, again, the tension in the media, and that can have a long-term effect on the abundance of insects. 
More recently, people have expressed concerns about light pollution and uh, the potential impact that can have on night flying insects um, like moths and also climate change. And the spectre of climate change is, is often there in our own work at the BTO with others has flagged up potential sensitivities of some butterflies and moths to warm wet winters, but also potential impacts of hot dry summer conditions on some insect groups as well. So there's a mix of different causes there. Well, despite having, having kind of um, had this uh, interest in, in insects during, you know, in, in my early years, um, I did a degree in zoology and then moved on to study golden plovers for a PhD at the University of Manchester under the, the late great uh, Derek Yolden and spent a wonderful three years in the Peak District studying the ecology of, uh, of, of golden plovers and what the, their chicks photographed here uh, eat, uh, what they do, their habitat use, survival rates and so on. Um, a very special time. And really what that work flagged up to me, which wasn't a particular surprise, but was really nice to show, was again the importance of insects and particularly uh, these things, crane flies or tipulids, which on the peatland habitats that uh, these golden plovers occupy, and this is a nice segue into the, the talk that John's just given, um, in the Pennines, uh, these peatland habitats, the uh, emergence of crane flies in May and June provides a super abundant food source uh, for the chicks and the growth rates and survival rates of young golden plover chicks was heavily dependent on the abundance of crane flies. So more insects equals more birds. And uh, in a review paper that's um, impressed in, in bird study, I've teamed up with uh, Roger Morris, who um, helps oversee the hoverfly recording scheme, um, to really think about uh, some of the key invertebrate groups um, that are important to birds and what might be driving some of their populations and particularly thinking about um, some of the uh, changes in, in temperature and rainfall and so on um, that could be underpinning uh, some of those changes. And in this paper, we um, pull out four key groups, soil invertebrates, foliar insects, aerial insects and aquatic insects um, as important for birds in a UK context. And what I'm gonna do, uh, for the rest of the talk is really focused on very much on the first of those, uh, the soil invertebrates and note the subtle twist, the subtle, the subtle change from insect to invertebrate there. And um, the other title of this talk was possibly going to be something along the lines of um, uh, soil invertebrate monitoring, opening a can of worms, but uh, Jain vetoed that one. And one of the reasons for um, being interested in soil invertebrates is that actually bird populations, populations of a number of bird species that that feed heavily on soil invertebrates. We've been talking about some of our waders, um, but species particularly like the missile thrush and the song thrush have actually been in long-term decline as shown here on the left-hand side. And actually those declines have particularly been most severe in Southern and Eastern England. So I've been interested in this for a topic for a while. And um, a few years ago, as many of you will know, we set up uh, with funding from EDF Energy, the What's Under Your Feet project where we um, ask school children to dig up bits of uh, their playing field um, once a term through the course of the year to uh, as a standardized habitat right across the country, really to test the hypothesis. Is there any sort of large scale difference in the abundance of soil invertebrates across the country? Um, the kids would then uh, hand sort those uh, turfs and um, as you can see, um, measure uh, the earthwork length of the earthworms, count the invertebrates, and some of the older secondary schools would also uh, weigh the abundance of the earth, weigh the biomass of the earthworms too, which gave us an ability to calibrate um, those data. And we had for the four or five years that the project ran before COVID put an end to it, about um, 400 schools, 450 schools a year taking part. So we reckoned we probably engaged about 25,000 school kids with um, real citizen science over the course of that time frame, and hopefully engaging. Uh, then with uh, the, the future and inspiring them with uh, with um, uh, biodiversity science uh, for um, the rest of their lives. And producing data for two uh, peer reviewed papers. So the first things we we found, and this won't come as a particular surprise to you as gardeners, uh, those of you who are gardeners, is that the abundance of soil invertebrates, particularly in that surface layer of the soil, um, declines during the course of the summer. Um, so in that June summer term, really significant uh, reductions in earthworm abundance uh, in green and biomass in yellow. And this is very strongly linked to the numbers of days since it rained, which we asked the, um, the, the children to, uh, to uh, record for us as well. Um, and it was quite remarkable. I went into one school, which in the spring had an tremendously muddy, uh, manic uh, hour and a half lesson with the kids counting, uh, I think, over 500 earthworms. And then going back to the same field just three months later, 
and they only counted 13. And they got it straight away in terms of what the differences were and the potential importance that would have if you're a blackbird or a song thrush um, struggling to find uh, food for your chicks. And uh, as well as counting the soil invertebrates, um, the, the school's uh, subset of them also undertook counts of birds on their playing fields. And the correlation between um, the abundance of those birds and the numbers of earthworms uh, was highly significant for those bird species, particularly robins, song thrushes and blackbirds, for which earthworms are important in the diet. That's the right hand box there. So really uh, flagging up that actually um, uh, there's a strong link between um, the abundance and the, uh, the numbers of uh, soil invertebrates available in that surface of the soil and the abundance of um, birds that feed on them. So this um, project really flagged up um, strong evidence for negative effects of drought potentially on earthworm availability. And of course, that does that would potentially explain some of those spatial distributions in the trends in some of our thrushes with um, drier, hotter summers in the south compared to the north. But having accounted for that, no overall evidence that there were fewer earthworms in the south than the north. And as I said, strong evidence for links to um, birds. But the project wasn't long enough to start to look at uh, long term trends and obviously can't uh, didn't look um, backwards. So this is where um, uh, some 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 more recent funding um, came in with support from a number of uh, major donors and, and members and supporters um, to really help us uh, drill down a little bit further and see whether we could, um, in a sense, turn the clock back and try and go back in time to understand whether there have been any long term changes in the abundance of soil invertebrates through time to explain some of those trends that we see. And to do this, what we did was um, drill into the published scientific literature, papers like this, a uh, fantastic um, sort of short monograph on stone curlew by Reese Green and others at the RSPB that includes for the sites that they were working in, in and around East Anglia, um, quantitative abundance data on the abundance and uh, biomass of earthworms. And there are lots of studies like this. So we were able to extract the, those data and then look to see whether there was any evidence in changes in earthworm abundance and biomass through time. So a number of questions that we had really, uh, do those data indicate whether there have been any changes in soil invertebrate abundance through time? And is there any evidence of those trends varying uh, with habitat? And overall, we managed to find data from about 111 studies over almost a hundred year timeframe and pulled out quantitative data on earthworms, uh, almost 100 of those, and about, um, I think, 30 to 40 studies on leather jackets, as well as information around the methods that they used, sample sizes, when those um, were undertaken and the habitats and so on, recognizing that methods have changed through time and we needed to account for that. Turning to the earthworm data first, um, you can see uh, we had a good spread of data from across the country. Uh, the intensity of the color indicates kind of the samples sizes uh, from the individual sort of 10 kilometer squares. Some studies, we didn't have a high spatial precision in terms of where the data come, came from, and those are the 100 kilometer squares that are shaded in, in pink there, but a good range of um, data from across the country. And um, what we found when we analyzed those data, and you can see they're plotted here, is that um, it looked like there was evidence for a potential decline in earthworm abundance uh, through time, equivalent to about a 33 to 41% decline over a 25 year period. Now, clearly these aren't data from a robust monitoring scheme, but certainly the, the, the curve in the graph and the results are suggestive of the, there being an earth and consistent with the hypothesis that um, earthworm numbers have declined across the country. Interestingly, there was some variation in the extent to which those declines um, were apparent between different habitats. Um, Perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, there was evidence of uh, declines in farmland on the left hand side there um, of between sort of one or two percent uh, per year. And that's consistent with obviously known um, declines in farmland biomass through time, sorry, biodiversity through time. Um, but interestingly, really strong evidence for declines in um, earthworm uh, abundance in woodland habitats on the right hand side of the order of more than four percent per year. And breaking these uh, these down into finer grain grain habitats, if you look at the block on the left, which um, describes a, su a summation of, of, of farmland habitats, interestingly, differences in density between some of those different habitats. It won't necessarily surprise you that actually it's um, the arable habitats on the left hand side there have got much lower earthworm densities, about 200 individuals per square meter, 
compared to um, pastoral habitats, where you're looking at about 300 um, earthworms per uh, meter squared. And significant variation in some of those other habitats at times as well, particularly low densities in a number of studies looking at industrial and polluted habitats uh, in purple there. And in terms of long term trends, um, evidence for significant declines, particularly on pasture in those urban environments, and interestingly, particularly in broadleaf woodland, as you can see on the right hand side. Now turning to the leather jackets, as I said, uh, fewer data that we were able to pull out uh, on these um, through time. And um, again, we analyze the data in a number of different ways and certainly no evidence for a, a decline in leather jacket populations. Um, they were either uh, stable or with some of the analyses potentially even have increased through time. Uh, there was only enough data to really look at abundances and trends in broad habitat categories separating farmland from unenclosed habitats, moorland and peatland and so on. And there was no real, no real, really no difference in abundance or trend between those habitat types. But I think that's maybe as much down to um, fairly limited data as um, uh, and, and low precision. Now, as I've emphasized already, um, these are unsystematic data um, captured really opportunistically from PhD theses, from the published literature, um, from various book chapters and so on. Um, they are not repeats uh, going back to the same locations through time. And therefore, you know, it's difficult to be definitive about the trends that have occurred. There's a number of reasons why, you know, those changes could be apparent without any um, uh, potential changes in earthworm abundance uh, underlying them. But we to try and look at that, we did analyze the data in a number of different ways, accounting for differences in methodology, accounting for differences in sample size, weighting different studies differently and so on. And at least for earthworms, the results are all very similar from all of those um, studies, from all of those ways of analyzing the data, suggesting that the results appear do appear to be reasonably robust. Um, but I think uh, it would be lovely to go back and actually repeat some of this sampling to have greater confidence in the changes presented. But irrespective of all of this, I think this really does flag up the need for a proper soil invertebrate monitoring program for such an important uh, group of, um, of, of, of species um, for uh, the environment. I think we really do need to have a better handle on um, uh, the changes in the abundance of, uh, of, of, of these uh, invertebrates uh, through time. And to put these declines in context, um, I started off talking about insect declines. Um, the magnitude of the earthworm declines here is shown by that red bar on the right hand side. Um, and it's actually a slightly greater uh, rate of decline than we see for butterflies and moths in a UK context, but um, less than some of the really large declines that have been flagged up on the continent in the blue studies. That's the, the aerial insects are from the Hallman study um, and uh, trends in moths, beetles and caddis flies from the Netherlands again, are much greater in magnitude of ranging between sort of 60 and 80% declines over 25 years compared to the 30 to 40% decline um, we uh, seem to suggest for earthworms. And some obvious questions result from this really, what is the potential cause of uh, a putative drop in earthworm numbers? And I think uh, a look at the literature suggests that actually quite a lot of things are likely to have gone wrong for, for earthworms over the, over the recent years. Um, agricultural intensification being a key one. Um, we know that uh, many pesticides are bad for earthworms. So clearly large scale pesticide uh, use um, could reduce their fecundity and inc increase mortality rates. Um, they're sensitive to direct cultivation. Many of the species suffer mortality with plowing and so on. And that potentially explains that difference in earthworm abundance between arable farmland and pasture, for example. And they're also sensitive to inorganic fertilizers, um, whereas they can actually benefit from organic fertilizers raising um, nutrient content in the soil. And changes in drainage, drier soils for reasons of agricultural productivity could well have a negative impact. And that could well also interact with climate change. I've talked about the potential impact that hot dry summers can have on their availability in the surface of the soil, but also earthworm demography can be influenced by uh, um, soil moisture levels, um, or even they can be killed by flooding. So there's a whole range of potentially interacting factors that could explain uh, these declines. So finally, kind of what's the, the potential sort of implications of these? And some interesting questions, I think, uh, come from, from this. 
Could this decline in earthworm abundance, for example, explain why golden plover and lapwing populations in winter seem to have abandoned many of their more traditional areas of, um, of, of, of use in central uh, England and uh, East Anglia and shifted to the coast, as you can see from changes in the map on the right hand side by past uh, BTO surveys. Is this symptomatic of a major problem in UK woodlands? Uh, we know that woodland birds are declining. We know that many um, woodland and habitat specialist moths and butterflies are declining. And I've plotted the rate of change for earthworms on this same graph as well. What's going wrong in our woodlands? And as I started off uh, talking, um, this potentially uh, would be consistent with um, earthworm declines contributing to declines in some of our thrush species, potentially in, in southern England. So that's um, hopefully uh, some interesting results from some very recent work that's currently working its way through the peer-reviewed literature. But I do just want to briefly flag up and return to the subject of insects and birds. Um, a couple of other recent studies that uh, BTO has done or, 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 or is doing uh, at the moment. Firstly, on willow warblers, um, which potentially could be um, sensitive to changes in, in foliar insects and, and in flying insects. Um, we've had a number of, of papers published recently looking at changes in willow warbler uh, populations and particularly flagging up uh, reductions in breeding success as being a potential cause for decline in the south of England. And then a very recent paper published by Blaze uh, and others earlier on this year in IBIS really flagged up a very strong effect of temperature on uh, willow warbler populations and changes in abundance using breeding bird survey data, um, providing strong evidence that basically over the last 25 years or so, it's just got too hot for willow warblers in England and that um, rising temperatures have played a significant part in contributing to their decline. Whereas in Scotland, um, where the temperatures are cooler, warmer warming has actually benefited and improved the situation for them. Is that down to uh, effects on um, if invertebrate availability is possible, and I think it would be really good to do some more work to test that. Um, and, all, and finally, um, looking at aerial insectivores like the swallow, recent uh, analyses looking at uh, nest record scheme data and the factors influencing the productivity of, of swallows um, flags up um, strong effects of laying date on clutch size. So certainly an imperative for the birds to arrive back in England earlier. Um, to, to, to lay larger clutches. But then once it comes to the chick survival period, a positive effect of, chick, of insect biomass from uh, Rothamsted uh, suction trap data on chick survival. Um, so clearly more aerial, more flying insects are good uh, for swallows. And um, uh, Rob Robinson is an author on a, a similar paper, um, also looking at this uh, issue for um, swifts that's uh, just come out, where I think there was less evidence for, for, for a link. So just to wrap up, I hope I've convinced you that um, long term invertebrate declines are likely to impact their avian predators and could potentially explain some of the declines and changes in bird abundance that we see around us. And um, we've done our best to have a go at, um, uh, at uh, understanding what's happened with soil invertebrates. And I think the results there are consistent with there having been a decline in earthworm abundance through time. And I hope I've shown you how changes in other insect populations um, could also be affecting some of our other birds like willow warblers and like swallows. So a clear take home message from all of this, I think, is that we need to look after our insects as much as we need to look after our birds or indeed to help us look after our birds. But I don't want any of you to think that I'm just interested in insects because they're bird food. Uh, and apologies to any entomologists on the call, but I do just want to conclude by um, saying that uh, we should be celebrating insects uh, in their own right as well, because they're a beautiful part of the biodiversity that um, we share this planet with. So I just want to uh, give special thanks to a number of uh, UEA master students who helped us in the early stages of this project by extracting some data and to a number of uh, BTO donors and members who have funded this project, particularly uh, Simon, Gillian Justin Wills and the Penchant Foundation and Kenneth Truth, whose gift in will also supported our work. And thank you very much for listening. Oh, and thank you again to Ailey, Rob and Blaze. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, James. That was fascinating. So we'll turn our attention to some questions now. Do get your votes in for your favourites. Let's see who's on the top of the list. Oh, we've got lots of threes that have voted. So I'll just start at the top. 
Has sampling taken place on allotments and should BTO be encouraging traditional gardening as a source of habitat increase? We haven't sampled on allotments specifically, and I think it would be really good if we'd have had more funding to have expanded the kind of what's under your feet project. But um, some of you might remember we did run a, a project with the BBC about three or four years ago, um, Garden Watch. And within there, there's certainly data on um, soil invertebrate populations um, from gardens that I think would make an interesting comparison. And there's more we could do to drill down in those in those days and again relate it to the bird use of of gardens um, i'm an allotment holder myself and whenever i it's not very good um, in terms of uh, in terms of relaxation because whenever i go out into the allotment to dig up my vegetables i find all the earthworms and are reminded of uh, bto work uh, like this uh, like this project but uh, i yeah i share the question and i and i do think that they can be a good source of um of uh, potentially uh, invertebrates for birds like uh, thrushes and blackbirds Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So um, a question with seven votes here from Chris. Um, are there any recent impacts of the use of veterinary anti-helmet? Hel helmet, oh, you know what? I was so sure I was going to pronounce it right. <laughs> Anti-flatworm medication <laughs> in cattle on pasture invertebrate abundance noticed. If yeah, so, so this has any been, scale. Sorry. Yeah, this has been something that's been that, that has been studied um, certainly by people. Um, I think uh, David McCracken up in the, the Scottish Agricultural College and um i think i think there is evidence for some negative impacts i think the uh, maybe the evidence is, is 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 mixed um i mean i've just kind of summarized that really in terms of um you know sort of uh, perhaps you know another mechanism by which agricultural intensification uh, could cause problems um, what I don't know is the extent to so you know, particularly sorry that that works particularly looked at things like uh, dung flies. What I don't know is how well and how strong the evidence is. I think in terms of a cascading effect on other maybe soil invertebrates, but I certainly think that um, and you know there are potentially questions there that either might be answered in the literature or would need more study um, about the effects of those kind of doses of of, of chemicals when they um, eventually make their way into the soil and the impacts those could have. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got two minutes, so we'll have another qu quick question. So with eight votes here, have um, from Linda, have there been any studies to determine whether all the so-called biodegradable plastics now used to cover fields to advance crop impact on earthworms? Um, that's a good question. I suspect that's too recent a phenomena to really have played a part in the data that uh, that we've looked at. Um, but I think it certainly um, uh, could be uh, an, a, a potential issue moving forward that again would need would need more work. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I, I have to confess I don't I don't know the details uh, of, of, of 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 that one. Sorry. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions that we've got time for to ask live, although I did see that John was furiously typing there and answering questions in the Q&A. So if you did ask John a question, do go back and have a look um, again. But I think we shall uh, move on to our final speaker now. Thank you very, very much, James. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Ailey Barnes, um, who deserves our special congratulations on the upcoming publication of her first paper, yay, um, which she's going to talk to us about today, which is um, uh, on the impact of protected areas. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, Ailey. You can get cracking whenever you're ready. Thanks, Finn. Let me just find my screen. Can you all see my screen okay? Or have I just messed it up? I cannot see your screen. Uh... That's because I haven't shared it yet. Apologies, two seconds. How's it looking now? I can now see your screen. Perfect. OK. Great. Thank you, Finn. Um, so yeah, my name is Ailey Barnes, and I'm one of the research ecologists at BTO. Um, my talk this evening is on our recent work about to be published as of next week uh, in the journal Nature, Ecology and Evolution on the effectiveness of protected areas for birds. And I'm also going to give you a sneak preview of um, some of our work on, um, sorry, some of our results on uh, butterflies as well. I'm having a mayor with the thing move over. Okay. 
So as we all know, um, biodiversity is declining around the, glo around the globe. And this graph um, from the last State of Nature um, in the UK report shows a significant decline in the abundance of 224 priority species in the UK, of which they have, of which they have trends for, showing a 60% decline in the last 50 years. Some species, such as the turtle dove, however, have declined even more than that, of about 95% over, uh, over the BBS period to 2018, so from about 1995 to 2018. The bar on the right hand side shows that 60% um, of the species showed declines, uh, showed declines and 21% um, showed increases over the long term from about 1970 to uh, 2019. And the more species with the increases in the short term from about 2014 to 2019 is presumably caused by new species colonising the UK, such as the cattle egret and cons conservation efforts. So most of the increases are for lo localised populations like Cyril Bunton or Bittern. The question is, how do we improve the situation for the, more, the, for the commoner, more widespread species, such as the skylark or the lapwing? So focusing on birds now, our bird indicators show declines in all four bird groups, um, with farmland with, with the greatest declines in, in farmland birds. And as we all know, this is due to agricultural intensification, but declines in woodland birds, for example, is less clear. But James and our work with James, um, uh, sorry, our work that James has just presented um, links um, could possibly link that decline in woodland birds to um, our earthworm earthworm decline, which is really exciting. So one method to try and slow or even reverse the declines in biodiversity is the de designation of protected areas. Adoption by the European Union of the Natura 2000 network provided legislation to protect areas based on priority bird species in the birds directive, and these are called special protection areas, or SPAs, or for general biodiversity or habitat, and these are special areas of conservation, or SACs. The UK already had nationally protected areas in respect to SSSIs, or sites of special scientific interest. SSSIs aim to protect representative habitats in a geographic area, whereas SPAs and ACCs are targeted at the best locations for their respective directives and offer greater legal protection. These protected areas are part of a broader suite of designated areas and, and, and these target uh, specifically biodiversity. And it's the effectiveness of all three of these protected areas that we investigated for birds and butterflies. So why we did this research? Well, as I already mentioned, but because the biodiversity is still declining. Previously, the Convention of the Biological Diversity, or the CBD, target set in 2011 was that 17% of land and coast be protected by 2020, which was barely met. The UK government reported 28% as being protected, but only 11.5% is specifically protected for biodiversity. And now at the upcoming CBD, or the Conservation of Biological Diversity, at the COP15, which starts next week, leaders will hopefully be signing up to the new target of 30 by 30, which is 30% of protected land and sea for biodiversity by 2030. So we were tasked to find out if these protected areas are working for birds and also for butterflies, which I'll touch on here. We wanted to know if there was adequate coverage of protected areas across the UK, if they're improving population status of birds, and ultimately if they're supporting and restoring wider bird populations. So we used three of our citizen science or volunteer collected data. The most recent two atlases in 1998 to 1991 and the 2007 to 2011, the whole of the BBS data set across the UK from 1994 to 2019, and constant effort or CES ringing data from 1990 to 2019 from which we only had sufficient data for about 22 species. Using complex, complex models tailored to each data set, which I won't go into, these data provided information on the occupancy, so whether they, the, the birds were present or not, change in occupancy, so colonisation, um, birds entering the population, persistence, where they didn't leave the population, so the opposite of extinction, uh, from, and from 180 um, atlas species. The abundance or the number of birds and the trend in abundance, so whether the abundance changed with time, in this case year, of 133 species from the BBS and productivity or breeding success from the 22 CES species. Our models accounted for habitat, latitude, climate and the effects of human population density. These results were then fed into a second analysis called the traits analysis, 
Um, and to infer what types of species were benefiting or not from the extent of protected area. So we looked at a species habitat association, the ecological traits of population size and overall UK population trends, the state of the population nat nationally, and whether they were of conservation priority. So whether they were annex or schedule one species or the red, amber or green listed species in the birds of conservation concern assessment. Just can I just ask that no, um, nobody shares us on social media at the moment because our paper uh, until next week till our paper is out. Um, but just show you our first results, so you're the first people to see these results, which is really exciting. Um, so this first graph shows the um, the main effect of each of the bird species. Um, on so again we've got the the occurrence, so whether the birds were present, the change in occurrence, and then mean abundance, and then change in abundance over time as well. And as you can see, um, sorry, and sorry, the blue dots um, represent all, all three of the protected areas combined. Then we have triple SIs in orange, um, SPAs in green, and SECs in purple. And as you can see, um, the, with, the great, with a greater amount of protected area in the survey square or site, there is an overall positive effect of protected area for each bird for each bird measure except what's well, shown by the blue dot which represents all, all these three um protected areas combined except for for trend and abundance and this is where my computer freezes and jumps ahead sorry um so the second graph shows um, the percentage of species with a positive effect of protected area and a negative effect of protected area for each of the bird measures. With the darker colours in um, is the significant effects and the lighter colours are the non-significant effects. So you can see, as you can see, there's also a higher percentage of species with a positive significant associations and fewer species with negatively, negatively affected by protected areas as shown in this, this bottom graph. Further analysis compared SECs and SPAs and showed that SECs, which are designated for birds, were statistically better than SECs, showing that designation for a particular species are working. And there's a strong effect on occurrence and abundance with a more positive effect on bird species and less of an effect on changing them. And the lower effect of um, this my laser pen's not working anymore, but anyway, hopefully you can see my, my mouse now. The, low, the lower effect of the trend in abundance is because about half of these sites are in unfavourable condition. So from this, um, we then went to see what type of birds were um, being affected by protected areas using our, um, using our traits analysis. So we looked at the mass of the birds, um, the, pop the national population size, and national population change, the Species Specialisation Index, um, the Species Temperature Index, and Habitat Association. And this graph shows that the species, rarer species, so the species with a lower population size, habitat specialists, shown by um, this SSI, so the Species Specialisation Index, as well as unsurprisingly, wetland and but also woodland birds um, do better in protected areas, and urban species do not. The negative effect here of um, national population change, um, so the national, national decline in species, can be, is a bit counterintuitive, but, but we can explain it with the following graph. So when we plotted this, this trend effect, so this uh, the abundance trend, against the, the log of the population, national population change, uh, we can see that the birds with a, with a, a, Sorry, that are declining. Let me get this right. Around, they're declining more nationally are more likely to be positively affected by the effect by the extent of protected area, or or at least less negatively may have less negative trends uh, in abundance in sites with greater protected area. A relationship that was again stronger with the SP, SPAs um, than SACs. So as previously mentioned, the strong declines in turtle dove. A, a farmland specialist may be benefiting for, from the extent of protected areas, presumably protected from over farming and other anthropogenic effects, as shown by, as shown by our results. The willow tit, spotted flycatcher, and lesser spotted woodpecker are also declining woodland, are, are, sorry, are declining woodland species. The willow tit is declined by 83%, and the a spotted flycatcher is declined by 46% over the BBS period to 2017. 
The lesser spotted woodpecker is now a rare breeding bird rare breeding bird panel species with a 33% decline from 1994 to 1999 and presumably we don't have enough data on the population status to get any more um, to get a more up-to-date trend and our results suggest that these species may also be benefiting from designated protected areas just from that graph there so we also found um, that occurrence and persistence, so occurrence here and persistence here, and again on this um, right-hand graph, um, of species that were legally protected uh, or of conservation concern were higher and significantly more so than unlisted or, or um, uh, green, green listed species, uh, where there was a greater extent of protected area. But this wasn't the case for abundance uh, or trend in abundance of species. But the abundance of red listed species was less negative um, or, and the trend was more positive than the amber and the green listed species. One possible explanation to the benefits we see could be productivity or breeding success. Even though productivity overall was not increased by the presence of protected area in the study site, some species, such as the tree creeper, sedge and garden warbler, which did have higher abundances, also showed higher productivity in sites with more protected area. But this was only really evident in SPA, so again, those sites designated for birds. So as you can see on the graph on the left hand side, where you've got higher abundance or species with higher abundance, you've also got higher productivity. Furthermore, for certain species, such as the green finch, we found that productivity increased more over time. And these also had more positive trends in abundance in protected areas designated as SPAs. So again, this left hand graph, sorry, the right hand graph shows you that the increase in abundance trend also showed increase in a, a increase in a trend in productivity over time, indicating that higher breeding success is associated with more positive trends in abundance. So we've seen different effects on the individual species. Now we want to find out if these effects add up to a change in the bird community. The community analysis showed that overall species richness was lower, was generally lower where there was more protected area uh, coverage, but supported more specialists shown by the community specialization index and uh, more cold dwelling species um, represented by the com community temperature index. They also experienced reductions in species diversity over time on the, this graph on the, the right hand side um, shows the trend in, 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 the, in the community. I don't know if you can see my thing above, it's not really working. Sorry, my computer's been on the go slow. Um, and I've lost my place now. So uh, yeah, sorry, so diversity was um, decreasing um, over time and with a shift towards again, more cold dwelling species as shown by the <coughs> community temperature index. Thus, communities and areas with greater protected area cover are more specialist, shown by the increases in the community specialization index, and cold adapted, but they are not, but they are not more diverse, potentially driven by complex responses across the species, as not all threatened habitats support high species richness or diversity. In a second paper um, led by my colleague Blaise Marte. We did a similar analysis looking at the abundance and trends in abundance of a 38 butterfly species from the wider country, countryside butterfly survey and the UK butterfly monitoring scheme data led by the butterfly conservation using the same protected area designations. So the SPAs, SECs and SSSIs. So the results, the early, the, the initial results show that um, of the Natura 2000 designations, SECs were actually better than SPAs because population trends were more positive on SECs than non-SEC sites, while SPAs had no effect on the population trends. Also, further analyses show that the priority species such as this, this peril-bordered fertility and the small peril-bordered fertility had higher abundances on SECs than SPAs. And they had more positive trends on SECs, as did species with small distributions, but not on SPAs. So this is the opposite trend um, from birds. So butterflies are actually doing better on the SECs, which are designated for biodiversity and habitat, um, rather than on um, sites designated for birds. So just to summarise, 
A, our analysis of this invaluable citizen science volunteer data shows that birds do better with more protected area and particularly SPA, so those designated for birds. Higher productivity may explain some of the effects and could be driving increases in abundance. Protected areas benefit rare and decline in specialist species and wetland and woodland species. Protected areas are less diverse, but support cold adapted species and may ameliorate the effects of climate change. Butterflies also tend to do better on protected areas and butterfly trends are more positive on SECs than SPAs. And this suggests that we need a diversity of protected areas across the country for, for the different taxa and, man, and, then, and also diff, a diversity of management strategies to um, benefit all different biodiversity and um, not, not just one. I'd like to thank our funders at JNCC. Um, this was part of the Terrestrial Surveillance and Development Programme and um, the reviewers of the paper coming out on Monday, so look out for it. Uh, and thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ailey. That was wonderful. Um, the questions I think I've started to roll in. I will just say really quickly that um, those questions for James's talk that have been answered in the Q&A function, it says that I have an answered them. I assure you I am not that smart. It is coming directly from the horse's mouth there. James is answering those questions, but it is just showing it as being me. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not clever enough to answer those questions. I'm a seabird person. Uh, but anyway, let's get on to Ailey's questions. Um, so let's see what we've got here. Um, so we have got, well, first of all, we've got comments saying this is very valuable and, and, and important work. We're very excited about it here at BTO. So keep, tell your friends. Um, it'll be out in a couple, in a couple of weeks. Um, so the first question then is, how much land is protected by EU directives in the UK in comparison with triple SIs? Oh, good question. I was actually... I, I'm meaning to actually look this up um, for our for our butterfly paper, um, but a lot of the um, ACCs and SPAs were actually triple SIs first. Um, some of them were triple SI, smaller triple SIs, and were made as AC, SPAs and AC, bigger SPAs and SPAs to cover in more area. Um, but there are still quite a few, quite a lot of smaller triple SIs over the country that aren't SECs and SPAs. Um, so I'm still I need to actually uh, analyze that and find out um, how much how much area is um, covered by triple SIs that aren't SECs and SPAs. So um, it'll be in the the butterfly paper <laughs> when that comes up, hopefully. Um, but there's still there, it's it's quite a lot of area. Um, but just in smaller chunks of the, the triple SIs. So sorry, I can't give you a definite answer. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so Humphrey Crick has asked, um, how did you control for the fact that protected areas tend to be biased in distribution to the north and upland areas? Yes. Oh, gosh. A analysis question. Um, we did. <laughs> um, we, we accounted for habitat. Um, but we also um, did, um, as part of the review process, we did matching, um, statistical matching as well, um, and uh, as, a, as a supplementary to our analysis, and it showed it didn't show any any difference in the analysis, it, difference in the results. Sorry, um, but there is there is the problem where um, most, like you say, most protected areas are either upland or wetland, which 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 tend to be protected anyway. Um, but the but the matching would have matched. Um, have, would have matched habitats. Uh, sorry, would have matched with the, all of our variables. Um, so it, it, with outside protected areas, um, and it, it didn't show any difference. So we definitely accounted for for the for the bias there. Okay, thank you very much. So our next question then is from Ali. Uh, do you think this work indicates that we should make more effort to manage for a wider range of species on special protected areas? or should we continue to focus on the management of the sometimes narrow suite of species they are designated for? Good question. Um, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of these sites aren't actually managed. Um, they're just protected. They're probably protected because they have those species yeah. anyway. Um, so I think going forward, a lot of these sites do need to be managed better. Um, but I think it's hard, it's hard to get to get the balance because obviously different different species and different taxa need different um 
different habitat requirements. So obviously birds need probably need more, well, woodland birds need more trees, whereas butterflies need more open sort of grassy habitats or uh, shrub, shrub sort of uh, habitats. So we definitely need to make sure we manage for a multitude of habitats um, all over the country. It's never easy, it was just, you know, um, managing for, for one taxa or one species, because even birds, bird species like to, need different habitats. Um, so that's not, it's not a simple answer. It's not a simple solution, um, but we need more um, work, more management, uh, and more just more talking about it, I think, to be able to um, make these protected areas better for as much biodiversity as we can. Um, but as we heard from John, um, you know, trees aren't aren't so good for for waders. So we can't just be doing, you know, doing one thing and hoping it will fix everything because it because it won't. OK, fabulous. Thank you very much. So Caroline asks, will this research be able to identify areas that should be designated? Oh, um, I mean, we only looked at the our survey sites and with the extent of protected area on it um so say your you know your bbs square one kilometer square only <coughs> a corner of protected area um you know that still made a difference to that to that whole protected area because obviously birds move so you know they've got the um so even having protected areas beside other areas and as you can see from the turtle dove turtle doves are farmland species so if it's be, if it's benefiting from protected areas, it's probably because the protected areas are beside it, not necessarily like on the because we can't protect the farmland. Does that make sense? Because we need the farmland um, for farming, funnily enough. Um, so yeah, so I don't think our work unfortunately can't signal a solution. We can just show you that they are working. So at the moment, um, like I say, when next week in the COP, um COP15, so the biodiversity COP, they are um, will be discussing whether to keep this, it will to keep the Natura um, 2000 sites. And obviously now we've left the European Union. Um, it will be interesting. Well, we're hoping that this work will, will go to the will, the government will see it and they'll know that you know the, the Natura 2000 is working. So let's not get rid of them. Um, let's actually keep 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 it going. Um, and keep protecting these areas, protecting these areas because they're working for birds and for butterflies. Okay, fabulous. So our last question this evening then is, uh, should we be seeking to expand our um, special protected areas, perhaps buffering existing ones? That's a good question. Um, yeah, because there's often the edge effect to um, special protected area, well, to any sort of area. The, um, my my PhD work looked at woodland, like smaller woodlands and the, the the edge effect. And as soon as you hit the farmland, there was nothing. You know, it was like a like a dead zone. So um I mean, I think it'd be harder to to buffer because, you know, are those buffers the same sort of habitat? Are they different habitat? But different habitat might increase predators. Um so like a lower shrubby edge might actually increase predators rather than, you know, protect the protect the, the smaller birds inside. So again, without without further research, that's a really hard hard thing to answer, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I mean, we do need to protect more land for for multiple reasons. Um, you know, for our biodiversity, for climate change, particularly climate change. Um, so, you know, yeah, protected land is only. But but I should say, protected land of these this designation for biodiversity because some land is protected, but not necessarily for, for biodiversity. It could be protected for its natural beauty or it, you know, it farming as well. So we need to protect it for the right, for the right reasons and the right things to, to help um, increase, well, to stop the biodiversity decline and um, m mitigate climate change as much as possible. All right. Brilliant. Thank you for that fabulously comprehensive answer. Very much appreciated. Well, that is um, all the questions answered. That is all the talks talked. So I think we're bringing this session to an end. So um, let me just have a look here. Um, I'm sure that you have all enjoyed this session. Um, at, the, at its peak, there are over 200 people on this call, which is more friends than I'm ever likely to have again. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the speakers, Ailey, John, and James, for their fascinating contributions. 
and all of you for giving your time to participate in, um, in the virtual conference. As I mentioned at the start, now more than ever, our research relies on your support. There are loads of ways you can support BTO. Many of you already do great things for us, but right now the best way you can help is by donating to our vital work. And you can donate where the need is greatest by following the link on your screen, which is bto.org forward slash support. I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us to, uh, later in the week. Our next session is tomorrow at 2 p.m. It's on our monitoring updates. Um, so expect woodcocks, seabirds, and geese and swans galore. Um, I'd also like to especially thank Nina O'Hanlon, who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes today to do all the little technical things. Thank you, Nina. Um, and uh, that is all for me. So thank you all very much for joining us and good night. <laughs>